um, shall we bow for a word of prayer? The next voice you hear will be Mr. Alex Asiedu. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your goodness and your kindness towards us. We have nothing with which to thank you. You are beyond our wildest imagination. And everything, Lord God, that we are, it is only because of your grace. Today, as we listen to the theme on fatherhood, the example, and raising champions, we want to pray for special grace, for your Holy Spirit to take absolute control over our lives. We don't want to leave this place as we came. We want to understand, we want to grow, we want to change. So, Father, even as Alex speaks to us, bless him mightily. Anoint his lips with coals from the altar in the heavenly sanctuary so that his lips may speak the words that you place in them. And that, Father, they shall be words even to change us, to make us better fathers. We are asking for this rare blessing in the mighty name of Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. Amen. Alex, we'd like to invite you to come up. Good afternoon. I hope I can be heard. Is it? It's working, right? Great. It's, it's an honor to be here once again. So thank you for calling me. In the next maybe 30 minutes or so, I'll speak about the example of fatherhood, the example in raising champions. I think we did a theme like this last year, so this will not be much different. Not much has changed since last year. Well, in that period, the person who I used as the prime example of, my prime example of fatherhood passed on, my father. So um, his memory still looms large. Right, the, just before I start, let me just quickly pray. Father, please use me as a vessel to bless the people here and those who listen, that we might become better fathers. In your son's name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Right. When I was about, I'd finished A-level. At that time, we used to do A-level. It wasn't SSS and those, those, I've forgotten the names of the exams these days. But when I was about 17, 18, and I think I shared the story last year, I went to see a friend at La Tebiokoshi. And as I was chatting with her, I saw my father passing in his car. And... He used, to live at, he used to live and work in Winneba, but he would come over weekends, be with us, and then he would go back. So I saw him. It wasn't the weekend, so I was surprised that I, I, I saw him. And there was a young lady in the car. So I, well, I didn't think anything of it, but I got back home, and when I went to Kokonsa Young Man, I should have kept quiet. But when I go home, I asked my mother, Ma, Nadawa, I think I've... So I have to put off one of the mics there. I think I'll put it off, thank you. So I asked my mother, Ma Nadawe. <laughs> she said, Ah, oh, we I said, Oh, there you. Me who do all that, there you. And my parents, for those who know me, I, I, I share this story a lot. And my parents, when I was growing old, they, did, they didn't strike me as a very loving couple. I mean, they ticked the necessary boxes, but they used to quarrel quite a bit. But she said something that I, I, I haven't forgotten. She said, eh. She said, eh, ono now papa de, on papa ontisa. Meaning that if it was him you saw, he'll come home because your father is not like that. He's not a womanizer. So she told me to go and hide in the bedroom next to the living room and see and watch what would happen. And I remember... Going into the living, going to the bedroom, and telling myself that ah, so this man, if he's cheating by me, it will blow time because he's always been the one. He'd always been the one who used to tell us, oh, watch yourself, be aligned with God, etc. So if he was cheating, then after all, why not? I mean, so I waited and waited. It took about thirty minutes, and he came home, 
And he's also called, he was also called Alex. So when he got home, my mother asked loudly, Alex, they, it's funny, they used to speak Ghana to each other, but we used to speak Chi with them. So he said, Ngbote, where did you go? Then he said, oh, he went to drop one of his students at La Tebio, because where I saw him, and that's where. And then my mother said, so she calls me Yao, Yao, semi kachel. That's Yao, I told you. And I never forgot that. And that's the theme for today. He set an example of fidelity and of faithfulness to his wife and his children. And I remember thinking, wow, if these people have been quarreling like that, my mother can say and stand on it that your father, he doesn't cheat. Then one day when I grow up, I want the same to be said of me. I'm speaking today about fatherhood, the example. Right. So he showed an example that I've tried to emulate. Now, just a point before I get into the, the, the bare detail. Fatherhood itself is not a destination. It's a journey. That's why I said I'm an imperfect child. But we will make mistakes. But the point is that we should make sure that we strive to become good fathers for the children we look after. And it does not necessarily have to be biological. We tend to be fathers for as many people as we can. It doesn't matter. But fatherhood is a journey. It's not a destination. It's not, so it's not one event, then you are done. Ah, no. It's a whole process until you pass and you're gone and you've left your legacy. But very quickly, what is the definition of a father? And if you go to the Bible or if you go to the dictionary, there are many, many definitions. So I've just picked a few for, for purposes of time. And um, a father is a creator, a founder. Isaiah 63, verse 16, it says, God is the father of men as their creator. But you are our father. Though Abraham does not know us or Israel acknowledge us, you, Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of old is your name. So a father is a creator, a founder. In fact, in the olden days, the father was the obodo at home. When he spoke, nobody could speak. These days, when you speak, they say, that you are not being fair. You are unfair. No, 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 no. Those days, the father was the final authority in the house, the creator, the founder. There's another definition which I find important, especially in these economic times. A father is also a provider. First Timothy 5, 8. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Hey, that's a burden on us, too, especially when there's e levy. <laughs> the father must provide. Now, so a father is a founder. A father is a provider. A father is a creator. There are other definitions. A father is a protector. That's who a father is. But we're talking about raising fathers to become champions. And very quickly, before again, I get into the nitty-gritty, who is a champion? If you get into the dictionary stuff, it says somebody who wins competitions, etc., etc. Who can help me with the definition of a champion here? There's one that I like, or there's one that I feel is especially important given the social construct that we have today. What do I mean by social construct? Everybody wants to have the biggest house. Everybody wants to have the nicest, the best paying job. Everybody wants to have the biggest car. I don't think that is what a champion is. I think a champion is somebody who fulfills his God-given purpose on earth, period. You could be anything. You could be a gardener. You could be a pastor. You could be a teacher. You could be a banker. So far as you know that what you're doing, you're fulfilling a purpose and you're doing it well as unto God, you're a champion. How does a father raise champions? And I listed, I've listed seven points and then we are done. The first one is to build a relationship with God. God is the ultimate champion, really. And so if you think you're a father and you're just going to just be there like that, Charlie, the way the world is, it will over you. One of the best examples of fatherhood was Abraham. He was obedient to God. He was not perfect. Now, apart from Jesus, all the examples we have, nobody was perfect. But the sum total of his life is that he lived in obedience to God. Look, he was so obedient that even his only child, he tried to give him up to God, Isaac. So he listened to God, and he was a good father. And because of that, he became a father of many nations. We need to build our relationship with God. You cannot model what you are not. How do we leave a relationship? How do we build a relationship with God? If you go to 2 Corinthians 3, verses 2 to 3, verse, it says, You yourselves are a letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. 
you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. The way I interpret this thing, it means that when we are modeling our relationship with Christ, it shouldn't be do as I say, but don't do as I do as Do it. Model it so that your children will see. If you build a relationship with God, you've ticked the first most important box of being a father. So that's the first point. We need, especially the men. Well, this is about fatherhood. But there are some mothers here who, or there are some mothers who might be listening who might not have men in their lives and might still be raising children. The first, the most important thing is to have a line with God. If you have a line with God, you are in the right place at the right time. Right. What's my second point? My second score on being a good father and raising champions is to show leadership and godly character. What do I mean by that? Godly character, leadership. Look, you can be everything. You might go to Harvard, you might go to Yale, you might go to Legon, you can be a doctor, a neurosurgeon, you can be minister for this, that, that, that. But if you don't have character, you won't do what God wants you to do. You won't model what God wants you to model. Look at David. He started well. Look at what he did with Bathsheba. Look at what happened to his household after that. He didn't even have the guts to correct things anymore. Look at Ammon and Tabar. Tamar. So the point I'm trying to raise is that if you do not model good character, it is very difficult for you to look at your children and say, do A, B, C, D, because you are not doing it. And so we need to model good character. And it is important, especially in this country where a lot of things don't seem to work. And right there from the very top, why do you think there's so much stealing and corruption in our everyday lives? It is because when we look up there, we see them doing it. And so because we see our fathers doing it, in quotes, our political fathers, the ruling class, everybody is doing it. And they don't have the guts to stop us. And so we need to model our lives in such a way that we're building character. One of my favorite stories from the Bible is the story of Samson and how he was strong and everything. And so if fighting was a technical ability or a skill, he was the strongest man wherever he was. But because he didn't have character, in the end, he fell. And when we are telling a story, we tell the story of somebody who failed in the end. So character is key. Without character, without showing godly leadership and character, your children will not look up to you. They are going to model the wrong examples. The third point. So I've spoken about building a relationship with God. I use the example of Abraham. I've spoken about showing leadership and godly character. Now, the third thing for building an example as fathers and for raising champions is that we should be present. Fathers, we should be present. Present, P-R-E-S-E-N-T. And why do I think this is important? We are in a society where the women tend to do more of the being present and the men tend to do more of the going out. So by the time you realize, I'm sure if you ask the men here what their children's birthdays are, they'll shake, Mikra, I'll shake a bit. <laughs> a bit. But if you ask the women, they have it all written down. The women know the nitty gritty of their children's lives. But the men, we tend not to be there. There's a verse that models this. Deuteronomy 6, the 6 to 9. These commandments, the mic is like the government of Ghana. Today is here, tomorrow is not there. Right. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. It didn't say talk about them when you are away and you've called them home or when you are away and your mother, their, their mother has called. You see, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Basically, we need to spend time with our children. Look, one of the reasons why I no longer like my bio to be read is, is that I feel it's actually irrelevant. <laughs> Why? When I die, I want it to be said that I was a good father and that I left a legacy for my children. And I don't really mind. I mean, I'll do my work, my professional work as unto God, but I realize that when you go to funerals and the rest, 
it is not the office people who come and cry. It is the family members. So I think that the legacy is more about the life that we lead for the people directly around us than anything. Their job. Today you are boss. Tomorrow you'll be nothing. It is your old wife, no, and your children who take care of you. So I think especially for us professional men, we need to remember that. There's this... <laughs> there's this... Have you noticed that teachers' children, eh, they tend to do very well? Yes. And when I say very well, note my beginning definition of a champion. I said a champion is somebody who's fulfilling his purpose in God. So when I say doing very well, it doesn't mean the person is the wealthiest. But you can see that they are well brought up children. And in fact, if you did a survey, you'd realize that teachers' children even tend to do better than pastors' children. Because pastors, they're everywhere helping the rest of the world and leaving them the home. Your home will collapse. And last year, I told a story about this lecturer in the US, it's a true story, who, who was trying to finish some work for the office. And his daughter, three-year-old daughter, comes up to him. And you know that between two and five, they can be very persistent. So she comes up to him and says, Daddy, I want you to see my best picture. And he says, OK. He says, let me just finish this thing, and then. So she goes out. And he wants to finish. Deadlines, deadlines. Meanwhile, the deadlines, because nobody dies from the deadlines. Me? Have you seen anybody dying from a deadline? I don't even know for these people. So she comes back after a few minutes and says, insists, Daddy, I want you to look at my best picture. My best family picture. And he says, let me just finish this. So he's a bit irritated. He lets her go away. This is a true story. Then she comes again. You know the three-year-olds, especially the daughters on their fathers, when they want something, they want it. So she comes, and this time, he says, you know what? Let me see the picture. And it's a beautiful, in their typical toddler style, she's drawn something. So when he looks at the picture, she's happy. And then he says, thanks, that's a nice picture. And then she leaves. Then he decides to start doing his work. Then he stops. He realizes that there's something wrong with the picture. In the picture, her best family picture, she's in the picture. Her brother is in the picture. Thank you. Her brother is in the picture. Her mother is in the picture. The family dog is in the picture. Opana, the lecturer, is not in the picture. <laughs> so he calls her and says, Ah, I like this, your best. She said, My best family picture. Why am I not in the picture? And in what I read, the answer he said changed his life. She said, because you are in the steady working. And he said it broke his heart because he realized that he had been chasing after the wind. And in the end, the people he was chasing those things to enjoy with were leaving him out. Fathers, we must be present. I kid you not. If you make that mistake and leave that gap, when you are old and the bones are getting... 60, 65, and it's now that you have to enjoy your children. Other men are walking them to the altar, and you are there, and nobody's looking after you. One of my best friends, she doesn't live in the country. Her mother has just turned 70. If she's listening, she'll say, I'll betray her, but I don't care because I've not mentioned your name, so that's it. She had a party for her mother. She's, got, she's gotten wealthy, but at an early age, the father did what a lot of fathers do, gave birth and then walked out of the house. So it's a mother who took them through everything. So just in two months ago, she had a party for her mother in Me Mexico. Said she wants to celebrate her mother's 70th. And family members, everybody was there. Obviously, the father, I don't know whether he was shy. So that was it. Then she called me about a month after. I said, oh, her father is in Kuma. She, she wants, so she sent some money. Because you should have seen the number of times the man was calling me. Just for some small amount. Oh, oh, she sent money. And I was thinking, look at you. When it mattered most, you were not there. Now you are begging for crumbs when the mother is enjoying. Men, what are we after? Sometimes, being there, just being there for your child to know you are connected, when they cry out, Daddy, he is there. You can set the example. It's more important than the next golf course, or whatever you're going to do. Being present is key. There's another story. That one I don't know about it, but it's about this investment banker who went to one of these islands somewhere and you know, some of these investment bankers, they are paid a lot. So he went for, an, he went for a holiday, one week holiday. And there was a fisherman, old fisherman. And 
he got some of the fish that the fisherman was selling and took it to the hotel. And at the hotel, he gave it to the kitchen staff and they prepared and the fish was good. So he goes back the next day and the fisherman is still there, usual. You know, these, these rural food, the same thing, consistent, doing it. So on the third or fourth day, and each time he bought and took to the hotel, it was enjoyable. So on the third or fourth day, he tells the fisherman, Master, I don't understand, though. This is your fish. The hotel staff say, it's world class. You know what? I'm an investment banker. You know what I think you should do? Need the language, volumes. Sell a lot. Sell a lot. So that you can make profit. So stay late. Six, seven, eight. Sell a lot. So that you can make profit. Do you have a family? He said yes. So that when you make the profit after like five, ten years, you can retire. Then you will chill with, the, with your wife and children. Do you know what the old man told him? That's why I closed at two. To spend time with my wife and children. The point I'm trying to raise is that none of us here has control over tomorrow. None. Not me. Not you. Not me. Not Ina. Nobody. And so live with your family, with your children, like today is the last day. There may be no tomorrow. So that when you are gone, they will look back and say that, ah, this is what I spent. This is the time that I spent with my father. This is what I did with my father. They won't look back and see office files that mean nothing to them. And so my third point is presence. It is key. Right. I hope you are not getting sleepy. Right. Before I move on to my fourth point, I'm just sharing seven points. So yesterday somebody asked me, why is it seven points? I said, I, mean, I don't know. I think seven is supposed to be a good number in the Bible, so seven is good. <laughs> and by seven, they are not feeling sleepy. So... so I was just reading something about, you know there's a crisis of youth and men in countries like ours and in the US. Did you know that 85% of the prison population in places like the US is men who don't have fathers? Yes. They didn't have any role models. They didn't have any people to look after them. And so, they just did anything. So we need to be present. Right. What's my fourth point? My fourth point is counter, or is it counterintuitive? I don't know. I've spoken about being aligned with God. I spoke about Abraham. I've spoken about showing leadership and godly character. Do not make mistakes that your children will want to emulate. David made a big mistake, and it cost him almost his household. I've spoken about spending time with them. The fourth is to love your wife. Hey, that one is not easy. <laughs> Okay, hashtag love your wife. That is, that is, and I said we are imperfect. The men, we are imperfect. So are the women too. But whatever we do, why somebody is doing bohobio, man. Let me repeat it. Let's love our wives. Listen, when we love our wives, and I think there's a, there's a is it not um, Ephesians 5.25? It says, husbands, love your. I don't, there's a particular reason why we were told to love the wives. Maybe it's because our eyes they sway that we see some things. I don't know. Do you see some things? <laughs> Tomorrow we'll talk about that. But the bottom line is that when you love your wife, you signal stability to your children. You signal security. They know that they are coming home to a loving place. And so they can be nurtured and they can grow in a godly fashion. I have a student, I lecture sometimes. I'm an adjunct in one of the universities. And there's a day that I was chatting with her. I hadn't heard from her in a while. So there was a day she came. And if you see her, very pretty, very well put together. She looks like she ticks all the boxes. She has a whole world. And she said she had problems. And I said, what's the problem? She said she hadn't seen her. I think I asked her whether she gets Pokemon. She said, no, she doesn't get Pokemon money. And I was asking her, why? Where's her father? She said she hadn't seen her father in years. And I said, eh. And then she started. She said, look at me, sir. Don't I look like a trophy daughter? Why have I not seen my father in so long? He doesn't even know. She's not, a, she's not even Ghanaian. She, he doesn't even know I've been Ghana steady. Look at me. And I was thinking, ah, which man will go have a child and leave such a beautiful child untended? And un well, she's graduated now, and she's taking care of her mother. She's gone back to her country, and she's happy. But the point is... A father's presence can make the difference if he doesn't love his wife between the pharmacist and the prostitute in the home. Yes. 
when your children know that you are in the house and that you are committed, you are there for the long haul, you are following Ephesians, husbands love your wife, then they can model that, they can be secure, they know that whatever it is, daddy is around. Because no matter what the women say, daddies are as important now as they were in biblical times. And so, I repeat for the benefit of the women, men, me too, I'm one. Let's love our wives. Let's, let's let our children know that our wives are our primary relationships and that we will treat them as the queens that they deserve to be treated. That way, we are modeling it for our sons to do. Look at the statistics. Typically, divorcees tend to come from broken homes a lot of times. When you are from a family where you see the father and mother sticking it in in spite of their trouble, that is what you are used to seeing. And so what do you also do? You also stick it in. And so we need to love our wives. It's not A, it's not B, it's not C. There's, it's not a, an either or. It's an exhortation straight from God. Men, let's love our wives. Right. The fifth point. So you've done the first four, you've loved your wife, your children are happy, everything's okay. But you can't pay school fees. You are not paying school fees. You are not feeding them. Hey! <laughs> sebi, Sebi, I'm the same one who said love your wife. If you love, we go chop. <laughs> Master, if you love, we go chop. Oh. The fifth point is provision. If you are a father, and you can, so I'm qualifying it, and you can, but you are not providing you are doing the wrong thing. Your first point of call is to make sure that your family is catered for. I didn't say well catered for because these days sometimes, in fact, as I speak, I owe my daughter, but she understands that I'll pay her back, so it's okay. But I think that I'm doing the basics. We need to provide. My mother-in-law, she's a very stable, stoic, very calm lady. The other day she was saying something and I was just listening. She said she's had a soldier friend there, and the soldier friend, when he went on retirement or so, I think those days they used to take them on peacekeeping. And she said the guy, he was just drinking around the place. He had a lot of children. He was just drinking. <laughs> and she said he did build a house. Okay, I'm in the house. But she said he built the houses behind women. <laughs> no. But the point I'm raising is that, so the guy has retired. And he had a car, C class. He has retired. There's no home for his children to. It's just the C class and nothing else. So he had to scatter the children in different people's homes. You know, there's a big caveat here. It is not always that we will have the wherewithal to do these things. But when we have and when we can, next to giving to God, our family should be our priority. Don't let it be said when you can that you went to blow time with money when you didn't want to pay your children's school fees or when you didn't want to look after them. If you do not provide, you are worse than an unbeliever. And I'm sure there will be questions coming, what if I don't have a job, blah, blah, blah. There, there can be answers to those. But a man should make sure that he has enough for his children. Don't let it be said. Here walks Alex, who had two or three children and they didn't see him and he didn't provide for them. No! When I was on campus, Legon, my roommate, sorry when I do, I look at the phone, I'm not on the net or anything, my notes are on the phone, but I'm old fashioned, so the phone locks and I have to do something for it to unlock again. My children should have been here. Right. When I was on campus, my roommate, we'd never seen his father. Then one day, just before we were about to graduate, I get into the room and he's chatting with this elderly looking man and the man is all smiles and my roommate looks very... Stiff, like the Bugasong. You know the Bugasong. Very stiff. Me try not those things. <laughs> so I'm wondering why. Then when the guy goes, he says, he used to call me Zizi. Shut up, my pop you. That's my father. I said, ah. And he said, now, those days, we used to finish when we were old. So I must have been like 26 then. So he was like 26. He said, I have not seen him since I was six years old. Oh, I've not seen him since I was six years old. Today, now that he knows I'm about to graduate, he's coming to look for me. How? 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 We need to provide. It's easy to make the babies. It's nice to make the babies. But 
we need to be as committed to making sure we've held the baby's hands, that we've watched them grow, we've provided for them. Because if we don't do that, we are creating a bomb in society. Right? So I've spoken about provision. My next one, so also all the nice, nice things. The next one is discipline. And in the modern world these days, for us parents, there seems to be a new dynamic where I don't know whether it's because we have fewer children. So, you know, me, I have five siblings. My parents had six, so they could twack one and know that the five are still <laughs> alive. Maybe we are afraid that something will happen to them. But have you noticed that we seem to be treating our children with kid gloves? They do something. We spare them. I took somebody, one of my nephews, to school the other day, and she was telling me that I was asking about his performance at school, and she said, he's doing well. And then I was asking about the exam topic so that we could study. And she said, I've already given them the exam topic. So I called my nephew and said, ah, so what topic? He said, she has not given them to us. I said, oh, but she says, the teacher says, I've given, her, I've given them to you. He said, no, you've not given them. The teacher said, you don't know it because that day you walked out of a class. Now, this guy is less than 14 years old. And I said, ah, you walked out of a class. She said, yes. And I said, what did you do? I said, I couldn't do anything. He just walked. I said, did he ask for permission? She said, no, he just walked. I said, hey, me, my time. You can't walk out of a class like that. Your father will know, your mother will know, your father's father will know, your mother's mother will know. But these days, she said, no, they are not allowed to lash them. The Bible says, train up the, way, the child the way you should go. Spare the rod and spoil the child. But we've left them, we've, we've treated them with kid gloves. We are afraid to discipline them. And so, they are becoming well-fed, well-oiled monsters, walking the corridors of our houses and our offices, driving. The other day, a young guy, 37, did Atuchi at the middle, in the middle. Who, how? Atuchi is when you are with the car and then you do those things. So, uh, it's, oh, it's screeching, Atuchi. Screeching, sorry, Atuchi, sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> Forgive me. No. So the point is, with all the loving and the provision and everything else, if you spare that rod, you are spoiling that child. And we spoke about character and how Samson rose and fell. Trust me, the guys at the top of corporate offices, the guys at the top who are doing well, who people look up to and say, this guy is carving a legacy for himself, they, are not, they tend not to be the guys who are the brightest in class. Who. They are the guys who have character. And that character keeps them. And that character was shaped either at the back of a whip or just with godly discipline. Discipline doesn't necessarily mean beating them up, but making sure that the standards are there and are kept. Discipline means preparing them for the world and not preparing the world for them like we've been doing. I have another friend. You know these days, because nothing seems to work that well in Ghana, so his child needs a passport. And he makes, we know those things, make one or two calls, come for the, whatever, whatever, whatever. So he sends the child when the call comes a couple of days later, he sends the child to pick up the passport. <laughs> and he goes to pick up the passport, whatever. Or it was either a visa or whatever it is. But when he went, he was given an envelope and whatever document was put in it. <laughs> so my friend is with a child. And a couple of days, he said, ah, who got your passport now? Do you know the answer? Minip. <laughs> When he picked the document, he didn't even check to see whether his own document was in it. But trust me, most of us here who have children, that is how we are going. We are doing everything for them. And so we are not preparing them for the world. We are not disciplining them. We are afraid or we don't think that we will be popular. So we are leaving them. When you discipline them, they remember. And like I said, it doesn't need to be tough. It doesn't need to... But the principles have to be laid and those principles have to be kept. We are not shifting those anchors, though, because our anchor is with God. God, he doesn't shift. The other day, my wife was graduating. She did a program somewhere. She was graduating and so the kids, one of them took the lead. She was graduating in a crop. One of them took the lead and the other one was supposed to, the other three were supposed to, I was supposed to go with them. And my wife, I hope she's not listening. She was brought up in a military home. So she's very precise with time, like me. Me, I hear you are precise with time. Don't give us pressure. 
She was very precise with time. And so she said, graduation ceremony starts at 8. I'll be done soon, so please don't be tired. Graduation ceremony starts at 8. No, at 9. So me too, I don't want trouble. Me, the, I, don't, I don't want trouble. So I said, okay. Tell the kids, we'll leave at 6.30 so that there's no traffic. Those days, the tolls were there, so there was still traffic at the Oyarifa. Amen. So wake up. My car was spoiled. So I said, wake up. We'll go to the office, pick a car. Pick grandma up, then we'll go. 6.30, 6, 5.30, I was up. They were not up. 6, they were not up. And if, I was getting up, so I said I wouldn't call them. 6.15, 6 6.30, they were now getting up. I said, make sure you do your household chores before we leave. Gave them up to 6.45. I knew poor grandma there by 7. You know the elderly ones by 7. So I sat 7, 6.45. They were still not ready. So I, and when I started the car, it wasn't working. So I had to take an Uber to the office airport and then go to um, Cantonments to pick my mother-in-law up. When I got there, I said, okay. So I called them and said, you can meet me at grandma's place. I mean, I'm giving space. When I got there, they were not there. They were not there. So I'm just, they were not there. So then I flipped. I said, okay, I'm leaving. I'm not waiting for you. So me and grandma were sitting there. By that time, she was already complaining. I said, leave, just let's go. Okay, a lot. Okay. You know the woman, when we allow you to talk, we are in trouble. I think next time they should do courageous men. Let's tell that sometimes when they talk, Charlie, I don't understand though. Hey, me, you have to do it. I'm digressing, but you know what my nephew used to do? He'll call his mother in Akosumbo. Then he'll say something funny. Then he'll leave her on speaker. So when we got to the Mahama Highway, we're using that route. They called and said they are on there. I said, no, I'm going. So they, I went to the Kropong. Then their mother called I mean, and said, where are you? They had gone back home. She said, no. Whatever way you do, whatever you do to come to a Kropong for the graduation, come. No car. So they Ubered. It was, it was great cost to them. But they, you see, the bottom line is that children have to know that for every action, there's a reaction. And most of us here, and beyond. We've removed the reaction from the action. And so like Nee said, we've created monsters walking out of town, walking around town. And that's why our town is about to blow up. All these many, many young people without any guardrails for life because they were not disciplined. Discipline your child with love. Right. Point A. I'm already on point. Which point am I on? Okay, all right. So that was, discipline is point six, eh? Wow. So point seven, okay. There are a lot of many things that we can do to be good fathers. I just tried to summarize so that we wouldn't spend too much time. We need to help them to build resilience. Champions are not people who rise, they eat latoji when they are babies, eat serilac. Serilac boom is that is it's nice. So <laughs> they, they eat serilac when they are what's it called toddlers, and then they grow, and then that's it. Champions go through obstacles. Champions go through defeats before they get to the top. One of the world's greatest boxers was Muhammad Ali. It wasn't that he was undefeated, but he could rise each time he fell. We need to teach them that they should be resilient. And that means giving them a space to love them unconditionally, knowing that it is okay to fail. Let me repeat that. It is okay to fail. Again, our society is such that when you fail, you're dead and gone. No. Let our children know that when they get into honest enterprise, when they put in effort and they've prayed and they've done their best, it's okay if it doesn't work out so that they can rise and they can talk to you and say, Daddy, today I didn't do well in this exam. Then Daddy will say, where did it go wrong? How can I help you? But when they do not know that it's okay to fail, once they fail, then it's as if the world has come to an end. Resilience is key. Your child wants to be a doctor. He's failed medical exams. And so what? And so what? It is okay to fail. We are all imperfect here. 
It's only Christ who was perfect. All of us have skeletons in our cupboards. But we need to create a certain space for our children so that they can come up to us and say, you know what, I did the wrong thing. This thing didn't work out. Then you can look at them and say, it's okay. It's happened to me before. It's happened to so-and-so. So rise again. One of the problems with our country is that we so denigrate failure that everybody is running away from trying again. Israel is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And I learned this from an Israeli. He said, they have this, and this industry called private equity. You can make mistakes in that industry, and they don't, people will still give you money to try again. And so when you try and try and try again, what do you do? You learn how not to do it. These light bulbs here, you guys know about Thomas Edison. You know that I hear he tried it several times before in the end. If it hadn't been for Thomas Edison, wouldn't have light here. And so our children need to know that it's okay to fail. Our children need to know that we are preparing them for the world and not the world for them. Because one day we will not be there. One of my best friends, I like mentioning his name. He said the other day he took his child to buy something by the roadside. So she got out of the car. And when she got out of the car, she went by the kiosk. And she stood there and he was in the car and he was waiting and she didn't come. And he was waiting and she didn't come. She goes to one of the best schools in the country. So he gets out. When he gets there, his beloved daughter is there and young children from the street are just passing here and crossing. She didn't have any of those skills softened by our supposed love. And so she didn't have that, those resilient skills. And so she was there. And he said, wow, he taught him that, wow. If we do not harden them, we are actually not preparing them for tomorrow. It's important. And so hardening them means giving them unconditional love. Prodigal son, the father, when he came back, he went to make mistakes, but the father still opened his arms for him. And he became okay. If we do not do that, if we do not remember that, our children when they fail, they will not rise again. If we do not remember that, that is how come these days there's so much of an incidence of suicide and depression amongst the kids. Small thing, maybe he has written to some girl and the girl didn't mind him, so he thinks it's the end of the world. What do you mean there? You know how people were bounced before they found their wives in this room. <laughs> I was reading a story yesterday on My Joy Online about a Chinese man. The thing was funny. He said, Chinese man bursts into tears because his son has failed exam. Did you see it? That's one of the silliest stories. He said every month, every, he had been teaching his son for one year, every midnight. And the son got six over, six percent. <laughs> so he said he's tired. You are tired how? It's a genuine, it's not an event. It's okay for our children to fail. If your child doesn't succeed in one enterprise, it doesn't make the child a bad child. It means that maybe God wants to open another door for that child. And one day you will not be there. So let the child know that failure is okay. Let the child know that you are there to give him unconditional love, just like Christ gives us unconditional love in all our imperfections. If you're able to do that, you are signaling to the child that baby, 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 one day I will be okay. Let me just quickly summarize what I said. I spoke about defining fatherhood. I spoke about provision and creation. I spoke about champions, people who fulfill their God-given purposes here on earth. I spoke about building a relationship with God. That was the first. I spoke about showing leadership and godly character, that you can take them to the best schools, but if they don't, if they don't know right from wrong, they won't do well. I spoke about spending time with them as fathers. Spend more time with them than anybody else does because they are your children. They are nobody else's children. I spoke about loving our wives. Hashtag love your wife. And the woman made a lot of noise about that. I spoke about provision. I spoke about discipline. And I spoke about resilience and unconditional love. You see, yesterday there was a press statement that the country was going back to the IMF for those who... So we're going back. And it just brings to the fore our litany of failures and this. It's always a tragedy of, and there's always negative news around. This has happened, this negative has happened. And sometimes you wonder, so should you be a politician or a minister or something to try and change things? My answer is not necessarily so. 
You can, but if you can't, your way of changing your society is first from your home. If you can change the spaces that are immediately around you as fathers, if you can build a legacy so that when you're walking somewhere or your child is walking somewhere, they'll say, ah, that's Anani, son of Joe. That guy was a good man. He's a godly guy. He's not corrupt. If we can do that in our spaces, we will be contributing towards making our world a better place because we need to do that and we need to do that now. Thank you very much and God bless you. All right. All right, so, hello, hello. So we've got um, time for a few questions. Um, I don't know, so look, can you be just checking the questions on Zoom for me and then asking them. If, some, if someone else can also check Facebook for me, I'd really appreciate it. Are there any questions in the room? Yes, sir. Let's start with you. Please, what's your name? Justice, Justice please, your question. Please come to the microphone here so we can all hear you. It's my, where's my favorite question? Michael, where's Mrs. Kusi? Okay. Mine is not a question per se. I just want to uh, say a few things to what she said. Thank you for your presentation. And I think one thing that as parents or as fathers, they can also do is to motivate their kids. You said it. But sometimes the approach to which we want to motivate these kids are problematic. In the sense that if a child is in school and then you want to motivate the child to be the best, you don't have to breed or train the child to get into competition with his other colleagues in class. I remember back in the days when I was doing my LLB, there was this girl who topped the class, and on the day of the graduation, they asked her how she became the best, right from the beginning of her education to the university level. And then she said that the father motivated her um, in a way that challenged her to be the best of herself and not in competition with others, in the sense that the father would tell her that for any grade A, that you make, maybe I'll give you 500 cities. So if she's doing uh, seven courses or six, it's 4, yes. So if she's doing uh, five courses or six courses at the time, she knows that if she makes an A in any course, she has 500 cities. So it will motivate her to get all A's, so that the father will pay her that amount. So instead of competing for the first position in class, that is not her motivation. Her motivation is not to be the first in class, but to get is in all the subjects that she's doing so that she could qualify for that uh, amount the father had said. So sometimes, as fathers, we want to motivate the children to be the best, but we should not motivate them to breed unnecessary competition among themselves. So we should train them to know how to uh, cooperate with people and to build teamwork so that it will help them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice. Um, Auntie Clara, yes. Who else, who else wanted to ask a question? Oh, okay, Phoebe and Theo. Oh, this is, this. I, I come with a question from Mrs. Kusi. <laughs> okay. Um, let me first thank Uncle Alex for the insightful gems you've given us this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I see a lot of societal norms based on, I don't know what, that mitigates against the godly principles we want to instill in our children. Recently we saw a father who came out to say that the son had abused him. I, I, don't, I don't support the forum he used, though. But then I see child write something. 
uh, forcing the man to come up using the same media to apologize to the son. And I was expecting that perhaps the son too could render an apology for assaulting the father because there was, there was a proof that the father had been assaulted. And so it brings to mind what we can do to help our children unlearn what society tells or shows us as the best. Instead of the godly principles we try to instill uh, in our children. What, what, what is your take on that? What do we do? Because we teach our children godly principles. They are societal norms, norms who teach them something else on right, let's say. So how do we reconcile these two? In training our children, bringing up our children, how do we help them know the difference or perhaps bridge a gap that will help them uh, grow up to be responsible children that we want them to be? Thank you. Thank you. Can we take Phoebe's question and then we'll take them two at a time? Alexa, are you comfortable with that? Okay. Or you want to do this one? If you remember the question. <laughs> Remember. Okay, let's do, let's do this one. <laughs> Charlie Man is growing old. So. It's a difficult question because it's as if the entire social construct is changing. When, and you're right, when I was younger, a man married a woman and it was, it was not debatable. Now they are telling us that and some of the children, is when they go to school, <laughs> you can tell that their opinion about those things is changing. Well, I think there's only one thing you can do. It has to start from the home. And I think that's why Christ is referred to as our uncle. An uncle, it doesn't move. Those principles don't shift. So they should know from whom what is right and what is wrong. If they know from whom and they go out into the big bad world, they remember and they align themselves with what they learned at home. When they do it at home, it is very difficult. I mean, like, and again, there's a caveat. You won't answer all the questions. But at least, when you've done your part, then you can let go and let God do his part. You get the point. You can't do everything. But once they know that my, my, my daughter is not in the country, one of my daughters is not in the country, and she... For her. There was an event last year, and I was just there when I got a call from a friend who my daughter went to visit. And my friend, my friend said, wow. I said, well, I said, your daughter was wearing a certain dress. I told her that oh, it's not good enough. Where she's going, she should show some more flesh. And she said, daddy will be disappointed in me. And this was over 5,000 miles away. So the point is, do your part at home. You can't do it all. And let God do the rest. But once you have built that they are aligned to that uncle, it is very difficult for them to be taken away from that. And that's actually your only weapon. Phoebe, let's hear from you. Um, after um, Aldansa asks his question, so I'll ask you to please read the questions on the platform. On the Zoom platform. Yeah, thank you. I really wish that you'd have allowed me to ask my question because it's um, very related to Auntie Clara's question. You know, um, the generation we were brought up in is a bit different from now. And so sometimes uh, in bringing up children in some way. You know, um, I want to ask, how will we be able to bring up our children when the environment where the school is a bit different from home. So for example, um, one of my sons attends a school where they just go to eat, they leave the bowls and everything, and then they go to class. And then he says, uh, one of his friends told him that after her, the mother irons her things. And this person may be somebody who is almost 12, because my son is also almost 12. But when he comes home, I make him do house chores. So he irons and does whatever is appropriate to his age. So he says his friend says 
His, her mother irons for her because her mother loves her. So, <laughs> so, so the, yeah, so if Charlie as is a boy and I make him do all the things that I mean he's supposed to do, then it means that probably I love him less. I, yes, which I, I know I don't. <laughs> and I know I'm doing the right thing in training him. So in a situation like this, how do we bring up our children in such an environment? As Auntie Clara said, you are bringing him up in, in a certain way. Then out there, it's a different thing altogether. Thank you. Yeah, but we'll, let's have... Um... And I was asking his own then. Okay, so uh, back into the life of Isaac, we had two boys. They were twins. And so there is a first, there is a second. How do we manage sibling rivalry when you have a second boy who is competing to be the first as a parent, as a daddy? or as, a, uh, as an adult in a community, how do you manage such children such that there will be harmony at home? Thank you. Was that Auntie Phoebe? Yeah, Auntie Phoebe, thanks for the question. I mean, my answer is the same as the first. It is difficult, but your child needs to understand that what you're doing is the right thing through your conversations with him, through the way you model your life with him. And then examples from the Bible, examples from real life. Let him understand that what you're doing is not the wrong thing. There'll be times when you come and tell you it's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. When they get to that stage, tell them that as far as you're under my roof, you're doing what my values espouse. And you can't win it all. And I think what we've realized is that they're, 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 it's not fair facing their lives when... They are trying to, and these days too, they are very clever. They'll give you some very nice arguments. Well, sometimes I have to go there. I call it the Bruno style. Hey, I'm paying your fees. This is my, this is my home. So far as you're under my roof, these are the rules. And one day, when you leave, you can let your mother iron for you or your whatever. But so far as you are here, you are doing these things. And it's not negotiable. So I will start by explaining. If you don't understand you will still have to do it. And, and, and fortunately for us, we still have quite a bit of, a number of levers. We have quite a bit of leverage over them. I mean, you buy stuff for them, you take care of them. And so, and they understand that language too. So you can start with, the, with a, a nice thing, but at a point, the buck will have to stop somewhere. When the, and where it stops is that this is the rule here. One day when you leave, I hope that you learn one day when you leave, you can do it this way. But so far as you're here, this is how we're doing it. In a loving, firm way. And you know what? I've realized that in a way, deep down in their subconscious, they actually like that kind of leadership. Because you're giving them guardrails to hold. I was reading a story in one of the British newspapers, and you know that's a liberal society, where somebody has written about her father and mother, and she said they were the worst parents imaginable. I was surprised when I read that. Do you know why? She said they allowed her to do everything she wanted to do. And she's realized that it didn't help her. So you be the bad person when they don't understand. But you need to insist on what is right. There was the other question was about <laughs> sibling rivalry. I, and again, you can do as much as you want. I think even in the Bible, there were siblings who were rivals. But I think it from the from biblical examples. What you, the signaling you need to send to reduce the possibility of rivalry is to be fair to them. They both need to understand that your love and treatment of them is equal. You don't love one more than the other. Don't signal favoritism or anything. So signal fairness. There's a book I was reading, and to treat, to, to, to treat a case of sibling rivalry, I think what, he did, what, what the woman did was that, I think they were sharing a cake or so, so she made the older one, there were two, so she made the older one cut the cake. And you know what the older one did, obviously. So it was a big portion and a small portion. Then she made the small one choose first. Yes. But she said it taught 
the older one the examples that she wanted to teach them. So we need a bit of wisdom, but you need to signal fairness, that the love for them, nobody is bigger than the other in your heart, and then pick it up from there. I don't know whether there are any other answers to add. Do you have anything for, on sibling rivalry? No, no. <laughs> Um, Fakosi, you wanted to ask a question. So my question borders on discipline. Uh, because I think sometimes ago we had, uh, I think a year or two or three ago, we had a seminar here concerning when children do wrong things, we should have a conversation with them. And so the idea of maybe beating or spanking was, you know, was almost being shed off. But then, when we look at the scripture to um, God says that God commended Abraham because he said he was going to command his household, so he was commended. Meanwhile, when we look at Eli, um, he was condemned because when he heard of the, the bad things the children were doing, he called them. He had a conversation with them. He said he, he had heard that they were doing so, so, and so, and um, what they were doing was not good. They should stop. At the end of the day, they were condemned, including Eli himself, the father was condemned. And I was also looking at the example you gave concerning your children when you wanted to attend a program. And then um, I was thinking, what if picking Uber or money was not a problem? How would you consider that as discipline? Because if they had money and they just Ubered to their place, so, so what's the big deal? So how do we? Marry this the, 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 the discipline. How do we really discipline? Because now teachers are not supposed to be their children. In fact, parents are not even encouraged to be their children. They should have a conversation. Eli had a conversation with the children. He was condemned. So how do we really? That's a solid question, and it's a, it's a question that's very relevant. But I think the answer is that we should pray for wisdom so that we know. There, there are best certain basic principles in the home, but I've realized that different children react to different medicine, where the discipline is concerned. And I'll share two stories that illustrate my point. So it will depend on the context. These days, when I was a child, if I did something where my father said, I won't give you a phone, I don't care because I did, there were no even mobile phones. These days, if you say you are taking your mobile, the, the child's mobile phone away from him, it's a very big punishment. So look at the context of the situation and ask God to help you to apply wisdom. There are certain things that won't work. These days, I have a friend, he's been beating his child. I've been telling him that very soon his child will be taller than him. Really. So you need to look at the context. Pray for wisdom and then apply that context. There, there was a time my father did something and, and, and for me that was probably the biggest disciplinary thing he did to me. And it didn't involve a cane or anything. But I never forgot that. So I guess he looked at me and applied the context. He was watching a film with sex scenes. And I told him that he used to live at Winnie So I went to visit him. He was watching it. It wasn't an X-rated film. But you know sometimes these films they have. And I, you know, 17-year-old with the hormones racing through me. When I saw, I was passing, I saw that scene. I stopped. And I asked him what he was watching. He said, oh, it's not for children. Oh, 70 years. So I waited. He went to sleep. I went to look at the thing. Those days, video deck, I put the thing in the deck. Bah! Pressed, play. You know, it was this big arrow, play. Guess what happened? The thing stopped. Yeah, it stopped. I'll never forget that day. It stopped. So I put it off. I, you know, the, the stop box is on red box. I pressed it. Bah! Stop. Then press play again. It didn't move. <laughs> he was asleep. I pressed play. I said, hey, what's going on? So I put off the whole um, thing by the wall, hoping that, you know, I'm not good at physics, so uh, then I put it on again, reset. It didn't start. That's when I knew that. Ojebi <laughs> Ribo. I'll never forget that day. So, but he was asleep. So I went to put off the mains in the, me, I didn't understand, no. I put off the mains in the, this, this one is double reset. Then put it on again. It didn't work. That's when I saw that. <laughs> so I started praying. And I went to sleep. Early morning, I woke up. I tried it. Still didn't work. By which time he had woken up. And he, he, he um, were at Winnie Bass Post, so it was a campus, so he could walk to work. So he could wake up late and then. So when he woke up, 
He went towards the deck. He said he wanted to watch something before. <laughs> hey, Charlie. So yeah, I kept quiet. Now my tail will call her. I was watching him. Then he tried to put something in the deck. The thing was not going. He tried again. Me, I was watching him. He said, ah. <laughs> ah, Obeka said, deck, do be be That's, and uh, Obeka is, is, is like, he say, it's as if there's something in the deck. I said, ah. Uh, he said, ah, then they shave. I said, um, and not film. He said, ah, eh. I said, yeah, he said, then they might say, oh, me not me this shave. This was in 1987. <laughs> I, yeah, it was 1988, so I was like 16, 17. Do you know what he did? Guess. Sammy, guess. He didn't watch with me. Who can guess? Nothing. Nothing. He just said, Maso, nafako sheka abu, na mefam repair. That was it. Boss, between the lifting and the carrying and the car, I wanted to bury myself in shame. I wanted no reaction, nothing. I wanted to, look, but... This was worth more than locking me up or beating me. Look, I was so ashamed. He never said a word. I think he knew that at heart I was a good boy, but I was just trying to be naughty. So that lesson of quiet discipline, I never tried, I, I never tried it again. So that's me. But I'm sure there'll be some boys too that you know that, aha. So, this, so you see, this is a father who was present and knew his child well. So he knew what button to apply on that child. So it really depends on the circumstance. It depends on the child. It depends on you and what you know about the child. The most important thing is that you should pray for wisdom so that you can apply. I told you the other day about my son and the car. You remember that story? How he came and said that now he's the owner. Hey, he's as much an owner as, um, as me. So he wants to he gave me five points. We're running out of time. So he gave me five. He's a, he's a wonderful little boy. He gave me five points. He said point number one. Now he's working small, so when he can be fueling the car like I do. I said, okay. Point number two, he won't be sweeping the house, but he'll be doing it outside. So the girls will do inside. I said, okay. Point number three, that thing we say when he goes out, he should come at a certain time. No? This, this town is dangerous. So when he goes, he wants to come around five. Yes. Be a modern parent is noisy. Can you imagine me telling my father that I'll come home at five? Who born dog? No. Point number six. Um, sometimes when he wants the car, I'll say yes. Sometimes I'll say no. It's inconsistent. And he's realized that it's because we don't want him to be entitled. He wants to assure me that he's no longer entitled. So anytime he wants the car, he's taking it. Master, what do you do? This one came won't work. Conversation won't work. But I prayed as I was chatting with him. So when he finished, I said, okay, oh, fine. I agree to most of the points. But the car, the ownership one, no. My car is an old four-wheel drive. Between insurance and maintenance, I spend about 30 or so thousand. I've forgotten the amount. I've spent quite an, an amount of it every year, about 20 or so thousand a year. You are my son. You've come home for holidays, December. So if you want to use it for December, 30,000 divided by 12 is about this thing. Give me that amount of cash and take it. He said, oh, this one, yeah. It's my rent for the month. So it's okay, it's okay. You, you can't be there. Problem solved. Problem solved. So the point I'm raising is that we need to pray for wisdom. But you need to have been present to understand the child you are dealing with. And there's something else I should have added. Sorry that I'm over answering the question. You know, those days, we could stay at home and not get into trouble. All you needed to do was to get a book and read when your father comes, you chat with him. These days, even when you're at home, the trouble can come to you. Take your phone, Ghana web. Then do. At this day, me, I don't even know. Do you know when I go to Ghana, they ask me, hair, hair, hair growth, um, hair growth. I don't know whether the computer sees me or not. No, it doesn't happen to you people, eh? They'll ask you a question. They'll, they'll, they'll advertise something that is directly related to your, your problems. Are you are laughing. You have my brain. You see what? 
So the point I'm raising is that even when you are at home, there was a day my daughter was at home, we had connected her phone to our whatever, and we realized that they were feeding pornography straight onto her phone. And she was not, she was not into pornography. So the point is that the system, the dynamics have changed. And because they've changed, you need to change. The only thing that does not change is your uncle. So even as you're changing, the rules are there. One man, one wife. Don't steal. Don't, those things don't change. But the way and manner you enforce it, be wise. I hope that answers you a bit. Um, Solomon, if you would read the questions on the Zoom platform, I'd really appreciate all the questions that are. So the question says, I've seen fathers who's gone through all these seven principles, yet their children didn't turn out that good, probably in the minority. I've seen children raised by single parents, usually mothers, who turned out to be good, probably in the minority. And there are also children who were not raised at home at all. Is it really what we do that makes champions, or it is those children and where God wants them to be? That's not a good question. It is a beautiful question. Thank you for that. God is sovereign. He decides what he decides. He decides what he wants. And so, you do your part. Let it not be said that you could do your part, but because you thought that God would do it. No. Do your part and let God do the rest. I used to think God used to operate with certain rules. I realized that one of my closest friends, they have an only child. He died last month. I used to think God didn't do those, allow those things to happen. God knows what he does. But what you want to do is to make sure that you are the right place at the right time by God and your children. So do your part and let God do the rest. It is not for you to say that, oh, I've done all these seven things or my, my, my office mate did all these things and the child became bad, so I won't do them. No way. In fact, when you do them, you reduce the probability that your child will turn out bad and you increase the probability that your child will end up being good. Do your part. It's like saying that you have an electric fence and you live in a gated garden so thieves can't come. Even the Bible, I think there's a part of the Bible that says the horse prepared for battle also, but it's the horse that delivered victory. So this is a direct answer. The fact that the, that same verse says that it is the Lord that delivered victory, but it didn't say the horse does not prepare for battle. So do your part and let God do the rest. That's all. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are any other questions in the house. Ah, oh, yes, please, ma'am. So the gentleman who asked the question. So you are, you guys are wearing the same thing. I'm right now. Me too. I'm being concerned. Is there a connection somewhere? Sorry. What's the connection, please? Oh, madam, madam. Hi. <laughs> okay. Happy Sabbath. Um, my question is that how do we reconcile the difference between some of the things that we as parents teach the children at home and some of the things that um, teachers teach them. So um, an example is, it may be the same thing they are teaching them, but they take different approach and then right now, it looks like it is parents that are co-jointly taking care of the children with us. So when I pray with my child at home, I usually say, Father, we thank you for blah, blah, blah. That, but I think last week, when we were praying, he paused and he was beating me. Mom, it's not like that. Auntie Mary says, I should say, Heavenly Father. So I should not say, Father, it is wrong. And then um, when he wants to be, I, I would say that, 
okay, take your wee-wee thing and go and wee-wee. That's what I say. He came back home and he told me that Aunt Mary says his pen drive. Take your pen drive to go and wee-wee. So, I don't know. It's not a bad thing he's, she's teaching her, though. But sometimes, some of the things, you teach them and they tell you that, no, my teacher says it is not that way. And because the teachers are the ones that stand in front of them, they tend to believe them. And now my problem is that with this example, it's not a bad thing. So what if it was something that is contrary to the beliefs I have as a Christian? It's how would I have recourse? Because it looks like now he tends to believe what the teacher says more at times. So he wants to call the things at home how the teacher says she should mention, he should mention them and not mine. That's my question. Hey, Charlie, things are happening. <laughs> well, madam. Madam, but I think that, again, nobody has all the answers, but I think it should be such that you are the one your child listens to the most. It has to be that way. And how do we create an environment so that we are the first points of call? Like I said, the way you model yourself, the way you interact with the child. Your child should believe that what mommy or daddy have told me are my gold standard. Now, beyond that, especially with this example, I don't think there's anything wrong with walking to the school and having a conversation with the teacher. It's not those, hey, I no, 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 you're sitting, I'm sitting here, look. This is a shared responsibility. This is what I'm teaching the child. Um, I, don't want you to, I don't want you to communicate different things from what I'm communicating to my child. So please, let, let's, let's, let's have it. I don't think there's anything wrong with I think these days we, don't, we do too little of it. Engaging the school and the teachers and say that this is A, B, C, D, E. I mean, it's your school, fine, but I'm paying fees and this is my ward. So these are these values and I don't think that... I think if you do that, it should solve this particular problem. It doesn't solve other problems, but like I said, beyond this, I don't drink. There are two reasons why I don't drink. And the first reason is that when I was, I was an exchange student when I was 17, and I had to go outside the country for a year, and my father sat me down, and he said, there are three things you should be careful of. I mean, the normal daddy-son talk. He said, woman, money and, and drink, or he mentioned three things. And, he's, and because I knew that he didn't drink, even when I was many, 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 many miles away, I, was, I went for parties and people were offering me, I told myself that I would honor him. But that's because he had that influence on me. So all I'm saying is, do your part, try and influence him. If it's not working, if that message that tells him that, listen to us, it's not working, engage the teacher. If you engage the teacher and it's not working, then you might have to go, you might have to change things. But the bottom line is, you know, how old is the child? Two years. So, so the bottom line is that at two years, eight months, you only have a 15 year window to influence your child. Beyond that, they are on their own. But the seeds you've sown now are what they will use when they are out. So the point I'm raising is that there will be a day when you will not even be there to hear what somebody else is telling you. But it is what you've taught them from the beginning. So don't give up. Continue. If it's not working, engage the school. Engage the teacher. There's a question here. <clears throat> what can I do for my son who was very quiet but suddenly changed his behavior when he enters college? He even ate his first semester school fees, and he's about dropping from school. Hold on. What the school fees do? He dropped the school fees. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. he dropped the school fees. So, uh, what can I do for him? This one is not take Uber Matao. This one, well, I don't know the full context. But what I would probably do would be to have a real conversation with him. I need to understand. If he was quiet and he's changed, there's something influencing him that is not working well for him. And it involves understanding it. Because for all you know, the thing that is working is some champion thing. It could be anything. But, he, but I would need to understand. Get him. 
And then after that, after I'm trying to understand, if I'm not understanding, then I'll start, I'll have conversations with him. I'll try and understand. If, I, if he's not understanding it, if it means changing the school, and I know changing registration at six months, but if it means changing the school, and he needs to know too that really eating the school fees, <laughs> it's not, it's, 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 it's corrupt, it's wrong. And so he needs to understand. And that's where the mechanisms come in. You can lash him. These days, I don't think it works well. But me, maybe because I work in finance, if you've eaten the school fees and I'm giving you pocket money, I'll probably calculate. I'll take small, 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 and use their pocket money to pay them. Even if it takes five years, I'll do that. Yes. So you need to think through, pray through, and engage. And I, I, I don't know whether I was... I was I, so I, like I was telling you the other day that the children, they're always using the air condition. These days, power is expensive. I told them when I told them to, I told them three, they were still... I said, by six, the aircon should be off. Hold on. So the pocket money, I said that, ah, the next time they were coming for pocket money, I surcharged them for electricity. That's all. Since then, pa. Yeah. Yeah. I'll go now. So, so, I mean, and I remember when we first got Wi-Fi, I told me, hey, the data was running. They, they were eating the data. <laughs> so, yeah, I made them do a budget. And they had Uber, this, that. I said, put Wi-Fi contribution in your budget. Pa. They stop eating the data. <laughs> so, so whoever sent this, you need to pull the child out of the school and, or go there and have a hard conversation and let him know that you're a good godly father, you are compassionate, that's one of the qualities, but there was no time. But this is wrong. There are cons there's a reaction to this. This is the reaction and stick to it. If it's not working, change the school. Lodge. Some people are influencing him and you need to move quickly. I don't know if we've got all the questions. Rolf, do we have all the questions? Is there another one? That's it. Thank you. There's a hand here. Oh, Ch Charles. No, no, just, uh, yes. There's a gentleman right behind you and then you. Sorry. But please go towards the mic, please, so that when he finishes, then you can ask, you can ask yours. Thank you. I hear mothers tell their words. This thing you've done, your father will come home and meet you. And um, I believe that we discipline our words based on love. So if a mother tells the word that your father will come home and meet you for doing this thing, how are you as a father discipline that child, especially when it comes to the type that you have to use a cane? How are you as a father able to discipline this child and make him or her understand that the discipline is out of love? I don't know if my question is clear. Thank you. It's a valid question. And, and some of the toughest moments when you're disciplining, you want to cry, but you know that, Charlie, this thing, you have to stick to it. So a, a way of doing it is to let the child understand that this is the reason why I am doing this to you. This is the reason why I'm taking your phone away from you for one week. This is the reason why you are grounded. You can't go out for a week because you did. The child must understand that this action has led to this reaction. And as for proving to the child that you love the child, the daily life you lead with the child should be enough proof. There will be times, no matter how sweet you are to the child, when the punishment and kuyi for the child, and the child thinks you don't love him. There was a time I thought my mother didn't love me because she used to let me wash my underwear. Me, ah, so why you let me wash my underwear? But now, looking back, so whatever you do, when you apply discipline, at the point where the discipline is being applied, it is painful. If you've explained to the child that there's a reaction to the action, fine, it's up to the child to understand. If the child does not understand, it is okay. Those who try to win the popularity contests, like free SHS, go to IMF one day. <laughs> I beg, this is not part of it. I beg you. This one, this one is not going on air. But the bottom line is, you don't need to win the popularity contest, please. All right. Um, so I, I have been analyzing a few things. You know, this whole area, it's not like it's one plus one and it should, it should simply be two, you know? 
my one plus one may work certain context. Somebody may try, it may not work. That, that's what makes it difficult. Now, I, I do remember, before I come to my question, I do remember back in school. Uh, this is, I think, primary. I went to Saito. I didn't go to, you understand? But we, we used to run shifts. And um, I think we were in the afternoon shift. So I came to school. And uh, somewhere around three, I left uh, class. So one of our lectures came in. He was looking for Charles Habia. I said, where is Charles Habia? You know where I went? <laughs> we used to play football those days. If you know uh, the popular K1 park. And I was very much interested in, <laughs> in football. But then my, my, my teachers thought that I was good academically. So uh, to absent myself from class, it happened about twice. So the third one intentionally came to class and asked of my name. I wasn't there. So when I came to school, it was a Friday afternoon, Monday morning, I was called in front of the school. You know what happened those days? And I was lashed. In fact, I never for forgave this teacher. But Way back at university, when I look back, now we've connected one of my best heroes. But then I look back, and I said, oh, at the time, I felt that I was being given a raw deal. And to the extent that I never spoke with him till we finished school, for two years. But when I look back, I thought that he saved me, because if I had gone along the line, my education would have been compromised. You know, I, I wasn't sure whether, I wasn't sure whether I could have made it as a footballer. <laughs> but I have never regretted, recently had his birthday and we met him and we had a nice time together. We played back. Sometimes when you are exacting the punishment, uh, those of us are receiving and we thought maybe it is not the best. But like we've all said, it serves as a direction for the child. That lash was the difference. I, my parents didn't know. I would always sneak out, come home very nicely. They never knew, you know, that kind of thing. If they were told that I had been doing that, they wouldn't believe it because in the house, you are sanctimonious and all of that. So that, that, that I thought, <clears throat> when I, I antagonized him, for two years, it became an issue. We all was popular in the school, it became an issue. Even when we left, we were not on talking terms. You know, when you finish school, you do these group pictures. Because of him, I said I wasn't going to be part of it. Well, it was that serious. To disgrace, I was in final year, to disgrace me before my juniors and all of that, for me, it was a big deal. But looking back, and that's what happens sometimes when we feel that at the receiving end, uh, it's not the best. Uh, I wouldn't know what may have happened. But then again, I have a cousin and, and who, who actually bombed SSC and I took him. The first fees I paid, private, he spent the school fees, just like we are saying. <laughs> so, in fact, I was I was furious because I thought that you had failed whilst in mainstream and have tried to bring you along. And he was given the impression he was going to class. Then finally when I got to know, he couldn't write the exam because he spent the school fees. You gave him money, he won't go. But then in the midst of my, my, my anger, I decided to find out why. You know, now he works, my office is the chief clerk. Then I noticed that he joined bad friends who were in the same group. So what I did is that I didn't, I didn't take it to heart. I changed the school and changed the environment. He wrote, 
He got his papers through. In fact, he had to write twice, apart from the first one. So he went three times. Eventually, he, he, he got it. He, he went through university. He's, he's almost a final year LLB. So I was just asking myself, if I had said, well, you have, did we say eat the school fees? And I've just closed the chapter. I may have denied him an opportunity. Once in a while, we make mistakes. And I think that it will be very important to interrogate because no one situation is exactly the same. You may have to understand the context and then ask yourself, how come he did that? It helps to interrogate. And the thing about presence is critical. Because for a long time, the industry I work in, sometimes whole week, my kids don't see me. And I was warned that it was serious. It was, it was, you can't go along this way. We try to change it now. And I'm saying that it's working a bit better. So sometimes, you may not go to the school to learn it, but some of these um, forums serve as very good guidance for us to build you know, a legacy for our children. But my question really is this. You know, and here I'm speaking as a church leader. Now, if you have lazy men, I'm touching on very serious nerve. I mean, as a church leader, you have, and, and I'm picking as I've spoken to arm leader and the rest. You talk to some of our men, they don't seem to have a clue where they are taking their families. Um, we've had discussion, this is the second year of better uh, courageous men. What, what do we do? We need to provide to be hard working, but a year you have, what do we do? It, it's a serious issue in some of our churches. Thank you. But you've answered the question. <laughs> All right. I mean, how do you change spaces so that the outcomes are positive and godly? You do your part. And doing your part is modeling your life, having conversations, having fora like this one. That's about it. I mean, really. Even in the Bible, there were people who went around trying to get the outcomes that they wanted, but in the end. So you do your part. You've sown the seed, and then let's leave it to germinate. You can't solve all the... You can't let every lazy man in this church become hardworking within, after this talk. No, you can't. But, look, but sow the seed, and let it go. If you've done gardening or farming, sometimes you plant, you plant two plants, you, you, you sow two seeds, one comes out, you don't see the other, then one day all of a sudden, the one that you were not seeing is becoming a flower already. So just do your part and then let it be. If you decide to worry yourself with solving the entire world's problems, there'll be no you to solve the problem because you die of high blood pressure or, or something. Bottom line is do your part and let God do the rest. But I would encourage more of these forums because it means that at least we are on the right path. And that's what's important. Ah, okay. Do we have any other question apart from his? So that's the last question. All right. On the platform, so Solo read that one. That'll be the last one. Thank you very much, sir. And um, for the presentation and all the, all the comments that have come in. Um, recently, there were a few messages that were read to us up there in church. Uh, it bordered, some bordered on access and use to contemporary media, mobile phone, gadgets and all. What is your advice in this day and age, going forward, taking care of kids who have access to all of these and how you manage them? Thanks. Goes back to, was it lawyer? Who is lawyer? Goes back to lawyer's expose on raising children. It's context. When my daughter was, I, don't, I, don't, I think we didn't allow her to have a mobile phone until she, like, she was like 14 or, or so. So for a very young child, you want to ask yourself, why does a young child need a mobile phone? But it gets to a time when the way, the way things are moving, I mean, 
when I was young, you never heard of abductions or kidnapping. So these days, again, the balance. But so what I would do is that now our last child is 19, 20, so she has her own mobile phone. But I think that if it gets to the stage where you feel there's the need, because these days to the schools, they will say iPad and the rest. And iPad, there's social media on it. But there are a lot of tools that allow for restrictions. So you need to get into those tools and understand them and apply those tools. And there are tools too that allow you to link whatever they use with your phone that, are, that help you to monitor. So apply those restrictive tools if it gets to a time when the child needs to have access to, to, to these devices. So apply those tools and monitor. And beyond that, there's really not much that you can, you can do. Don't say that because the world has become a crazy place, you will lock the child in the room and the child won't have access to social media till he or she is 21. You even get access to the university because those, where, where I work these days, we've been at home for so long that 99% of my meetings are on Microsoft Teams. It's like Zoom, but it's for corporates. If I didn't know social media, I wouldn't be able to do presentations on it. So it's a, it's a, it's, you need to find a healthy, godly balance. But whilst they are very young, apply those tools that restrict, link your devices to it, and monitor. And let's hope that the Lord will let it have a, a happy, godly outcome. Okay, there's a question, <clears throat> I think it's coming from Nigeria. It says, how best can one raise a boy who is 14 years that is engaging in vices like stealing, lying, that lives with you in the same house while taking precautions as a brother-in-law, and you do not want your little children to get influenced by him? That one, is, that one is not easy, eh? So apply the same standards you would apply to your own child. At 14, he's on the cusp. If he doesn't learn quickly, you're asking for trouble because of the influence. So apply those standards. One, two, three, four. Hopefully it'll work. If it doesn't work, then at that point you need to, yes, get him, let him go. I mean, one bad apple can spoil the rest. So we are trying to make sure the apple is okay. So apply the tools that we've spoken about. If you realize that the tool is not working, then you need to have a hard call. He's your brother-in-law. or he, so, he, so you need to have a conversation with those that, that matter and say that, look, at this point, this is not working. I fear about the influence on my children, so let's look at a plan B. Last one. At what age will you stop taking a child's phone? What age? At what age will you stop taking a child's phone? <laughs> if I answer this, my children will know. <laughs> again, lawyer, again, everything here at this point is context. So like the anchor, the values that don't shift, the rest of it all is context and wisdom and balance. In my case, I stopped checking the phones pretty early because I felt that we developed trust. So I think by the last time I checked, anybody's phone was like age 15 or, or so. Because, I, and I don't think I am wrong, because by God's grace, they tell me everything. They think they like somebody, they'll tell me. So I didn't feel. So again, it depends on the vibe. That's why you have to be present to know your child. It depends on the vibe. Um, what I did was I told them, look, I'm the Bruno of the house. So I won't touch your phone, but I reserve the right at any point in time to take the phone and look at it. Yes. So you see, when there's that mindset, that's Charlie, somebody can look at then it kind of guides the, guides the behavior a bit. So I wasn't intrusive, but I reserve the right to. And I applied that right only like once or twice. But the message was clear. Again, it is context. There are some children who are sneaky. So send the message quickly. You can monitor the phone. And as long as they are not a, me, my rule of thumb is this. How, no matter how old you are, so far as I'm paying your fees, master, I still call the final shots. That's it. But I'll apply the shot in a nice way so that you don't know that I'm shooting, but I'm, I'm shooting. Thank, Thank you, you God very bless much. You all.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, so we at least have some kind of blueprint for fatherhood and, uh, and the importance of the example. Tomorrow we'll be looking at love, marriage, roles, and responsibilities. And it'll be 3 o'clock, 3 p.m., um, as, as, as we did today. Um, this place will be open, so please feel free to come. But you can also catch us online. Please invite others. I think the painful thing is to hear this information and know that there are so many of our friends who actually just need some tools to guide them, and we don't share it with them. Thank you very much, Alex. God bless you. And we'll be looking forward to hear from you tomorrow. Um, before you sleep tonight, make sure you send this invite. You've received the invites on the platform. I mean, there are people who are harassing me every time that I don't even put the, you know, the Zoom link on the line. Throughout the first 10 minutes of the program, you have to send it. So please, help us. Send, send it out so that more people have it um, and, and, and learn from it. Shall we be upstanding? I don't know. Um, I don't see. Um, Adabia, you want to do a very brief um, Vespers for us and then we close? Very brief. Please, we don't want you to leave the room before he finishes, so please, brief. It will be brief. Amen. You have your hymnals. Let's turn to 286, first stanza, and I'll share just about two minutes of word, and then we are over. 286, works of life, wonderful works of life. One thing. take a few inspiration from the experience of Paul. Now, you know, in Acts 9, we have the story of Saul who was changed into Paul. But there's some lesson there that I want to draw attention to. Now, Paul was very religious. He was a Pharisee. A Pharisee has three basic features. A Pharisee is supposed to know the Torah inside out. A Pharisee proclaims self-righteousness. And so they see themselves as superior to any other Christian sects. A Pharisee prays at least three times a day. And fasts, if for nothing at all, twice a week. They were, in summary, very religious. But the word of God says, even in that state, Paul was not born again. Two words I'm using as we bring the Sabbath to an end. He was religious, but he wasn't, he wasn't born again. It is possible to be in the church, do all the stuff we do, but you may not be changed at heart. And one of the areas that the word of God is very clear. It's about fathers, husbands. He says, if we can't provide for our family, then we don't even qualify at all to be leaders. It's a very, very strong statement. And so, as we avail ourselves through some of these useful lessons, comparing notes, the Bible says, iron sharpens Iron. 
Let's not make them as a formality. Let's learn something out of them. But back to the story. Until Paul had an encounter, personal encounter with Christ. He thought that he had it all. Not knowing for all those years proud to the Damascus experience, it was cost 90. I pray that as we serve him, we will not be seen to be going through the motions, but we will be changed really at heart, including our fatherhood. May the Lord add his blessing to this short exhortation, even as we bring the curtains down. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are going to ask just two people a lot we have said today. And believe me, if you can't take serious lessons from here, God himself will not be happy with you. So I'll ask uh, 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 my brother, um, oh, why is Absa? <laughs> oh, how come? Cyril, Cyril. Cyril will pray to commit all the men into God's hands. It takes special grace of God. I've always said, Alex, you know, sometimes I go a whole three days, I'm confessing, and I don't see them. And I, and I said, hey, are they safe? You know, it keep caring to me. But thank God for that woman in my life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh-huh. So we're going to pray for the woman too, that they, they'll be also be supportive uh, unto us, so it will complement each other. Uh, who will represent the woman? The birthday girl will do that. Mrs. Nogam, so please come. Very brief. Our time is Hello. Up. Hello. Shall we rise for a word of prayer? Gracious Father, we want to thank you for the privilege of prayer, of coming to your feet just as we are and giving ourselves wholly to you so that, Lord, you can mold us and use us in the way that, Lord, you want to. Because, Lord, you are the creator. Without you, we are nothing. We live only because you breathe in us. And Father, we are grateful. We thank you, O Lord, for once again gathering us for these very important sessions. Talking about raising men. Men who would really fulfill the purpose for which, O Lord, you created us. And Lord, as we go through the lessons, Lord, we see a lot of shortfalls in us. As we share knowledge, we see ourselves lacking in, Lord, what you really want us to be. Father, we are giving ourselves only to you. First, Lord, we are praying that these messages that we receive will really sharpen us and will really help us, O oh Lord, to be in tune with you and the purpose, O oh Lord, for which, Lord, you have created us. The challenges facing us are huge. On our own, Lord, we cannot achieve. On our own, we will fall flat and fail. Father, may it not be said that any of the men in this church online, watching us, part of this program, any of us will experience such. But Lord, may you, O Lord, continue to renew your spirit in us. May your still small voice continue to speak to us. And as Uncle Alex said, O Lord, may we always hear that your small voice so that we can apply wisdom that which would lead our children and our families in the right direction. Father, we know nothing, but we are only counting on you. Help us, O oh Lord, to be the role models that, Lord, we have to be. Help us to be the examples that our children can follow, that our families, our wives can follow and testify of. At the end of it all, Father, may everything that we do 
bring glory and honor to us. Strengthen us. Make us wiser in a world full of confusion. Help us, O oh Lord, to do that which is right. Help us to be able to stand firm against the challenges of this world, the corruption, the vices that are pulling us apart in society. And help us to stand firm and be anchored in you so that our families can also be anchored in you. To this end, we say, oh Lord, we are just human. We are giving all back to you. Use us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Most gracious Heavenly Father, at this moment we commit all women into your hands. Father, as mothers, as wives, as sisters, Father, we commit the women into your hands. Men have spoken, Father Lord, we are seeking your face to help them. Grant us wisdom. Grant us love. Father, you created us to be helpmates for our men, for our husbands. Wherever they've fallen short, grant us the wisdom and the grace that we need to support them, to fill in the spaces for them. Help us, O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, to be able to do this, so that together, Father Lord, when the time comes, Father, we'll be able to present our lives, our children, everything that you have entrusted in our care to you, that Father Lord will not be found wanting. But we will say, O oh Lord our God, the task that you have given us, we've been able to execute it to your name's glory. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So tomorrow it's 3, p 3 p.m. Tomorrow, 3 p.m., wherever you are, if you can't make it here, just go on Zoom or YouTube or Facebook and you'll find us 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Please don't miss it. Thank you. Tomorrow we are talking about love, marriage, roles, and responsibilities. Thank you. <laughs>